Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Pittsfield Historical Society for uh, one of our programs. This program has been two or three years in the making. Uh, COVID interrupted uh, having Bruce and Penny here to speak about, uh, I said cod waning, but it's cord waning, uh, which is uh, the, the lost art. There's very few people that still make 18th century shoes. Um, Bruce is uh, quite accomplished in other things, too. He does timber framing. He makes musical instruments. Uh, and probably a lot of other things besides this particular craft, but we're very pleased to have Penny and Bruce here today to talk to us about cord weaning. Take it away. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. As was intimated, Bruce. This is Penny. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. You mentioned the lost art of shoemaking. I just wanted to say we found it. It's not lost anymore. <laughs> <laughs> A um, little bit of a preface, my shoemaking historical knowledge is Epsom based, so we had to visit with Larry, I forgot Larry's last name. Are you here tonight, Larry? He's no, not. No. He's not, okay. Provided us with a bunch of information. How much of it stayed, I don't know, but one of the benefits of marrying a smart wife, okay? <laughs> She's got the information, and she's seeing to it that I have access to it while I speak. So, um, Also, we're going to talk about some stuff that's here in town, but you just heard how limited our information is. If you know more about what it is we're talking about, we're going to talk about some of the shoe factories and stuff like that. So if you know about the shoe factories and want to share it, I mean, we're here to learn stuff about about Pittsfield, so you know, don't be afraid to speak up. So, can you uh, just move a little bit that? I'm, I'm going to sit down. Okay. <laughs> so on with the show. Here's my. These are my crib notes, Benny. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Some of the earliest found shoes. Top left, you can see it's completely made out of some kind of reeds or something like that. And the top right, that's more like a Viking shoe. It's one piece. You can see around the toe how it's gathered together some. Um, this is a early Roman. This one here is early Roman. That one is a, um, I think it's Pilgrim Century turn shoe. On the bottom, bottom right, it looks like a, a two-piece shoe. It's just a, a four-part. Let me point a little bit if I can. It's just got the four-part. This is called the vamp. The back is one piece on that pair of shoes. And it usually, modern shoes, there's two. And the two pieces are called the quarters. And then again, you can see the moccasin in the upper right. <coughs> These are shoes from the 1600s. Now, you can see how the tongue, there's a, there's a hole right there on a, on a lot of them, uh, right here, right here. I have been told by <coughs> shoe experts that uh, the bigger the hole, the greater your wealth. Okay. I, the only thing that I could think about was if the big elongated hole there had some embroidery on the on the hosiery. It's, and I had I don't know that. I'm making that up. It's complete speculation. But the uh, the bigger the hole, maybe the less you need to go outside in the winter time. I, I, you know, again, pure speculation. Um, these are Pilgrim Century shoes, modern, of course, because I've made them. Um, this pair up here, you can see it's a, a more wealthy person's because the hole is bigger. That uh, on the upper right, that, those were yours, weren't they, Penny? No. No? Okay. The ones on the upper left, yeah, somebody bought them. They, okay, the upper left yeah, were yours. I, All right. I was wearing them, but... 
<laughs> I've made I've made her half a dozen pairs of shoes. She gets a chance to sell them, and she does. <laughs> right off her feet. Right off her feet. <laughs> That's great. So one of the myths that we hear all the time is people think that pilgrims had buckles on their shoes. They did not. They did not have long racks. Correct. So there's a picture that we all saw in elementary school of pilgrims with tall hats mm -hmm. with buckles on the front. Yeah. Big white yokes dressed in black with buckles on their shoes. Okay, if you've ever been to Plymouth Plantation, they know the truth of it. That picture was a blatant lie. Okay, the pilgrims liked color just as much as we did, as, as we do. They had all kinds of different plants to color their clothing with, to, you know, so. That picture, somebody just made it up, and that's what we knew until we were in probably high school. 18th century shoes. You can see the buckle shoe there. This is also a buckle shoe, or it, this one has a button on it, but that slot right there is to accommodate either the button or a buckle for gentlemen's knee breeches. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, you, you had breeches that went to just past your knees, and they were often. And I'm, I'm pointing to that because you can all see from in the dark and everything, right? <laughs> so um, there was a buckle on the outside of each pair of knee breeches. Well, there's there are buttons there, um, and it was the same buckle. It was a small buckle, and for the lady shoe, that's a lady shoe that would have had a, a, a small knee buckle there. This is a, a pair of mules, and this is a partially made pair of shoes. Now these, are sh these are the shoes that we make. Now, this is a lady's shoe, that's a lady's shoe. But historically, those were gentlemen's shoes. Mm -hmm. King Louis the umpteenth of France was short and he was intimidated by that fact so he made a law he, he told the shoemaker he invented high-heeled shoes and he told his shoemaker to make him high-heeled shoes and then he passed a law saying that nobody else could wear high-heeled shoes <laughs> all right little guy syndrome right so well his buddies nagged him he was setting a fashion statement he's making a fashion statement we want to be like you, your majesty. So they nagged him enough, so he said, all right, my friends can wear high-heeled shoes. <laughs> then he started coloring his heels red. No matter what the pair, what color the shoes were, the heels were red. Royalty. Mm -hmm. And he passed a law, just like the one you can't wear red heels. <laughs> Same thing happened. His buddies nagged him and nagged him and nagged him until he said, all right, you, uh, my friends, can wear red heels. Well, that became, if you've ever been presented at court, you were allowed to wear red shoes. Which is, it, there's a funny story that I like to tell. You know, we, we travel the circuit, we go to colonial reenactments because that's where our customers are. This one fellow, let me stand up over here if you can see a little bit, maybe you can hear a little bit. This fellow, he's portraying a fop, a dandy, white pasty face, star on his cheek, two foot tall, wig with a little three-cornered hat on top of it, dressed to the nines. And he says to me, he saw this shoe here, and he said, could you make this in my size? And with red heels. <laughs> and I said, well, that depends. And he's kind of puzzled. And he says, on what? And I said, have you ever been presented at court? <laughs> and he says, of course. <laughs> so I was letting him know that I knew the rules. And he was letting me, that, letting me know that, of course, yes. Did you make them? I did not. <laughs> I haven't seen him since. <laughs> 19th century shoes, the top left. Looks more like a like a gentleman's dress shoe. Um, all the rest are ladies' shoes. 
Um, and they, they were the earlier they were made on uh, you know this that seam was probably made on a sewing machine. Same thing with these seams. Um, this one might have been done by hand. Um, this one here might have been done by hand. But uh, so, but they span the 1800s. And these the Victorians, those are all ladies. Um, ladies, ladies. High on boobs. How big were the heels in the 18th century? Um, it depended on the wealth of the, uh, the customer and the desire of the customer. Now, one, one thing, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and talk about 10-footers because that's what uh, shoes were made in 10 by 10 buildings. And um, economy is the same then as it was now. If you drive up to my shop in a, a Rolls Royce buggy with six footmen on the back, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, I can tell the butter side from the dry. Come in, sir. What can I make for you? And if you're rich enough and want to show off enough, you're going to have me make something completely different. If you want a pair of high heels, I'm going to make them. The problem we have is there's not a lot of space in a 10-foot building. So there's usually only one last. Jumping ahead again. This, can you see it? Uh, there's, a, there's a spot. Everyone's seen these, okay? You've seen them with candles in there. You've seen them holding open doors. The shoe is made on this. I'm going to demonstrate that in a little while. But in a, in a 10 foot shop, 10 foot by 10 foot shop, there's only one of every size. You'll see it's not left or right. It's called a straight last. And we made them that way, one, because we just plain liked symmetry during that time. Another reason is because we only need one last in a 10 foot by 10 foot shop. Now in that 10 foot shop, I, the master, am going to jam as many apprentices in there as I can afford to feed. So the more people you put in there, the smaller your shop gets. So, and you do have wealthy customers that want specific shaped shoes. You can get shoes in lefts and rights back then but you had to be wealthy enough to afford it. So you're going to come to me, I'm going to say, absolutely, I can make you a pair of lefts and rights, and that's going to be your pair of glass. Maybe you even keep them at home and bring them to me when you want another pair. I mean, that's speculation on my part. But anyways, um, so I, that's, that's a, a sidetrack, because I have ADD. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is Penny, is Penny dealing with Andy? Oh yeah. Okay, you just doing the next slide. Everything's good. Right. Um, you want the next slide? Yes, please. Let's try. Sure. All right, Liz. Yeah. All right, Liz. <laughs> cool. I pressed the button. <laughs> okay, this is probably a European shoe shop, and you can see soles right there. Um, that might be a counter. This stuff here that might be a ball of wax or a ball of thread. It is a ball of thread. Um, upper pieces right here. The shop in question, this lady is outside the shop. This gentleman is inside the shop. The whole front is open to allow light in. So you work as long as the light lasts. Um, top right is just a uh, sh uh, shoe store, shoe shop sign from obviously 1828. Bottom right is a, a shoemaker. Um, the stuff that a lot of the stuff that I see is from colonial times, except that's more modern. The stitching clam is more modern. 
I can't identify the tools there because they're too jumbled and blurry, but um, he's using a method that I'm going to demonstrate later on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. This is our friend Peter who runs the shoe shop at, at uh, Sturbridge Village. And he's a, uh, he, this is an 1830s shoe lasting jack right here. This is a table similar to mine here. And all of his tools are jammed over there. Mine, this is a coffee table made in the 60s. Don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a cobbler's bench coffee table. I have another one at my parents' house that's a coffee table, but it's better suited because it was made like with knife holders and things, you know. So, um, anyways, that's the shoe shop. You can see behind him, there's another bench. Um, up here, if you've ever been to Charlie Yatton's Seconds to Go, he often had a shoemaker's bench right there on the left. I always wanted one from him. He had a half a dozen of them. And every time I saw it, he said, I, I saw a new one, he said, I always think of you when I, you know, I'm sorry, I, I can't afford them. So, All right. but, uh, yes, please. And that's very close to the one that, that you just saw Peter sitting at. And there's the lasting jack in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, and then you can see a, a few of the lasts right up in here. I don't know, I think that's in Sturbridge. And at Sturbridge Village, they make all the shoes for the people that work there. So they're wearing 100% period correct shoes. Um, next, please. That's the, uh, that's the one that, not the exact one, but that's very similar to the one that Charlie always had. Next, please. Some of the tools, some of the same tools I have. These down here, that's a bundle of pig bristles. This is the thread. It's either linen or hemp. Um, in many cases, hemp, historically, hemp and linen, the words were interchangeable because they're very similar products. They, you, you, you wreck the stock, you pull the fiber out of the stock, and it's just long and can, you know, as long as the stock is. And you take enough of that and you twist it up and you make the thread out of. Now you taper the ends of the thread and you fasten it. There's a magic way of fastening it to the pig bristle. So the pig bristle becomes the needle. You use curved awls to make holes. And then once you pull the curved awl out, you put the pig bristle in and it follows the hole. It's flexible. So, I mean, it's genius, it's tedious to do. It's something I've never learned to do. But I still think I'd like to sometime. <laughs> so, lasting pincers. I, actually, that pair is right here on my workbench. And I can tell it because it's got the broken handle. <laughs> you remember Bob Feeney? Yeah. Okay. Those came from his shop. I used to go down there and I'd find shoe, a hammerhead, just a hammerhead. And he wanted a buck for it. I'd bring it home and it's a shoemaker's hammer. I'd polish it up and use it. And so any number of tools. I think I paid too much for that. He wouldn't let me pay anything more. You remember Bob, right? <laughs> it's it's worth what it's worth and not a penny more. <laughs> so, um, next slide, please. Oh, last oh. answers. I get what's going on. <laughs> All right, then you want the next one, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and then, the, the, uh, one more. Oops. If you click and click and click, it gives you, I think it's giving you the picture and what it is. That's a soul splitter. Uh, and I don't remember where that was. I'm sorry, I'm standing in front of you. Don't worry about it. Um, next, please. That's a lasting jack. See if I can demonstrate with the picture. There's a hole right there, the one that the candle gets shoved in. All right, you put that right there. That I don't know if you can see that. It's spring loaded, and 
obviously that's oversized, but you put it, put that in the hole and lift it up. This here is cupped on this surface right here and smooth so that it hugs right there. And it stays there and you last, you do all the shoe lasting on that. So this is one of the 10 footers. Uh, I think that was Ed and others. What's that? Right. I think so. Uh, Ed had it moved to his place and replaced the chimney. He's got a full fireplace in there now, which never would have been in a 10-footer. What they often had was a chimney that went right to the bottom of the eaves, and it was braced up with, you know, steel bands. So the bottom of the chimney was supported by steel bands that held on to the, the timbers that went across here. And the stove pipe went up and into the chimney. Sometimes the stove was elevated also. Um, so anyways, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, again, for a 10-foot building, so this was probably 12 by 10, or maybe it's 8 by 10, but uh, it's, it's a little narrower than it is long. All right, this is the, I need my crib notes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, then. 1826, Cotton Drake brought a shoemaker from Haverhill to teach his sons, and apparently there were enough other boys around that, I mean, everyone wear shoes, right? If your kid makes shoes, he's never going to be hungry. Right? So, teaching his kids, teaching the neighborhood kids to make shoes, that was the start of shoemaking in Pittsfield. Um, uh, crib notes. Okay, they were making shoes for the factory and Haven, you would tell me about the, the factories oh, and tons of shoe right. shops in Haven. So Pittsfield was connected with the Haverhill shoe factories back in the early 1800s. So, um, just, just, you know. yeah, the 120 pairs of of shoes here. That was the first major consignment of shoes from Haverhill. In I mean two. Pittsfield. Yes, please. If you want to just click until the, the frame is full, yeah, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, James Johnson brought stock from Lynn to make shoes. Now, I don't know what that means, brought stock from Lynn to make shoes. I don't know if he bought leather or if he brought shoe pieces. Um, we have a diary that was, again, pardon me, but from Epsom, that was kept by Lydia Locke. She and her husband, Joe Locke, farmed in the winter, I'm sorry, farmed in the summer and made shoes in the winter. They got shoes from Andover and from stone factories in the 1880s. And um, they recorded, between the two of them, they recorded making 20 pairs of shoes a day. Wow. Now, that is not start to finish making. When you're putting the uppers together, you're closing. The up, sewing the uppers together is not making. It's closing the shoe. When the shoe parts go into the lasting room or the lasting area, and they get wet, and I'm, that I'm going to demonstrate because I've got the upper sitting in the bucket here. Um, the upper, all sewn together, gets saturated, and then it gets stretched over the last that I just showed you, and temporarily tacked in place. Leather is wonderfully malleable when it's wet. I like leather, it's so darn forgiving. So you stretch it around the last, and you tack it in place all the way around. And I'm, I don't know if you can see, I'm demonstrating it <laughs> with my fingers, so <laughs> in the dark. 
But um, so anyways, when you're lasting the shoe and putting the bottom on the shoe, stitching it to the inner sole, stitching the inner sole to the outer sole and the welt and everything, that is considered making the shoe. Um, so, all right, um, Mr. Drake freighted the shoes to Lynn in a one horse wagon, but he outgrew it and then sold the business to his son. And next slide, please. Oops, sorry. No, no problem. And you want the next one? No, this no, just a, another. Did, uh, we went. We went. We just went forward, Penny. We finished that slide and moved forward. Okay. So this is just another shot of the ten footer again. As many windows as you can fit, or maybe as many as you can afford. I don't know. <laughs> Glass isn't cheap. Um, I'm looking at my crib notes to see if I'm missing anything. Okay, Walter Drake bought a large two-horse wagon. The, the transportation of the shoes to and from Haverhill was too much for one man to do while he was making shoes. So he sold the business. Um, uh, let me, he sold the business. I think it was to his son. And um, his son bought the two-horse wagon and that was all he did, was transport, transport parts and shoes to and from Haverhill. So this was to Lynn, but I, I think that was a couple slides before. Yeah, it was the other guy. <laughs> yeah, if, if you catch me making something up and you know the fact <laughs> of it, don't be afraid to say. Because, like I said, my, my knowledge of this stuff is, my, my knowledge of Pittsfield is Epsom. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the Pittsfield, once the Blueberry Express came, um, the, again, in Epsom, it was the same, same train line. They'd pick up parts, they'd put the shoes together, and they'd send them back to, I'm sure, Haverhill. And they also, we had records of using a factory in Stoneham and a factory, and I just said it a couple of minutes. Andover. Andover, thank you. And um, so... Once the, shoot, once the trains came into town, I'm pretty sure that what they were doing is that they were, the factories were sewing the uppers together. They had rooms filled of, filled with farm girls that went to the big city to get jobs, and they're all sitting in front of the window with a sewing machine putting the uppers together. And the only way that they could, that Joe and Lydia could have been making 21 and 22 pairs of shoes a day is if they're only lasting them and stitching them to the inner sole. So, and then they sh shipped them back to the factory. And they might have been doing, you know, 50 pairs of size six ladies, for instance. And, and, and that's, again, speculation on my part. But rather than send 20 different sizes of lasts and uppers, yeah, we're, we're making size tens this week. You know, I mean, it just makes sense to me as a shoemaker. So, anyways, next slide, please. All right, this is a, a load of hemlock bark for tanning. Um, until, I don't know exactly when the tanneries started using chromium, chromium salts for the tanning, but uh, for thousands of years, tree bark was used for tanning. And what you did is you ground it up and you put, you, you dammed the pond. You dammed up the pond and you filled it with hickory bark, for instance. And you'd throw your hides in and if the pond was deep enough, you could, have, you could put frames on them. You might build walkways over your pond so you could walk out to the middle of it without having to wade. Pick up your your uh, hides, your frames, if you've got them on frames, pick them up, and what you do is you cut into it at the edge, and you look and see how far through the leather 
it's tanned. If it's still white in the middle, then you either throw it back in and leave it set longer, or you throw some more bark in. Um, you can tan leather with salada tea. It's tannic acid. You'd want an awful lot of <laughs> salada tea, but just it, it's the same thing. You're making a tea out of the bark and tanning it, and depending on the bark, the way the hide accepts the tanning or the tannins, um, you know, if, if your tea, if your tannic acid gets into the hide and the bark is depleted, you've got a weak tea. You need to strengthen the tea so that you can finish tanning the hide. So, um, anyways, next. Um, you can see the star of Pittsfield. Uh, I think one more click. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Thanks, man. All of the green areas are manufacturing centers. Now, if you notice, there's a river. There's manufacturing on the river. There are a few spots. River. 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 There are a few spots where there is no river. Those must have been later when steam came in. But all the all the industry for first couple almost first couple of hundred years was powered by water. So you dam it up and you take as much water power as you can milk out of it. So, so yeah, Dover had shoe factories, Rochester. Farmington, um, Ware, and I've heard that Pittsfield had one or two as well. Somersworth <laughs> did too. Did they? Um, but most towns had. Uh, the, the Narrows. I think it's the Masonic Temple. I'm, I'm sorry, Northwood. I think it's the Masonic Temple that was a shoe factory. I'm not sure. I, it's, this is an old memory, so don't trust it. But uh, anyways, that's a shoe factory in Lynn. And you can see it's what five stories. Um, the bottom one might have had a retail outlet, but um, the lasting room in a shoe factory. Now, there's two machines back here that I can't identify. The shoe lasting machine was made in the was invented in the 1850s, I think. Um, and during that time period, the inventor was black. He came from Africa. So for him to have invented and become wealthy because of inventing a shoe lasting machine was, I mean, just so incredibly cool, you know? But those, those machines back there might have been shoe lasting machines. Um, the rest of the area that I could see in there People were doing it by hand the way I'm going to demonstrate. So, um, this is the Epsom shoe factory. You see all the all the natural lights up on the top because these don't provide enough light. This is where the Epsom Baptist Church was. It was slight, slightly further back that from that. That is behind on the other side of the river. But I looked up river one time and I saw I, what looked like a, a bricked up something and I said is that the dam for the because you know the river was falling the right way and everything so I never did walk up there because wasn't that interesting <laughs> yeah it's where then later you'll see it, it burned but House of Kirk was in that area kitchen clean it's all in there it was a lace factory so yeah that's the, the, only sh the, the shoe factory became Eventually, I think it became Pittsfield Weaving, and um, but it was owned by the Zinn, the, the Zinn family. They turned it into a lace factory and a lace and label factory, and uh, I think they became Pittsfield Weaving, but I'm not certain of that. Now okay, this was on Joy Street. Am I right, Penny? No, Catamount. No? Okay, this is Catamount. All right. You've got some notes there about. Anybody? I ditched the notes because I couldn't keep up. Okay. There. <laughs> 
<coughs> so yeah, I built an 18 for 11,000 on the cabin now. Um, this piece here was built first. This is the new addition. Again, it's a, it's a three story, so probably all of the shoemaking was done in this building and later in these two. There was which, a different company. There was a different company. Okay, that that's before. that's what I was. Right. This, it's this one. I was trying yeah. to remember. And There's I, a different shoe company on each floor. I have the names of them on the paper, but... And there, yeah, if you want to see the paper afterwards, you can <laughs> look at my crib notes. Mm. <laughs> so we got 1909, that part was built. This is another view of it from the end. Mm -hmm. You good? Yeah, perfect. Spent a lot of time in those buildings before I took a bit. Yeah, the, the uh, with like well, the, well, the fire station was. Yes. yes. Okay. Somebody else will know. He would yeah, he the fire station. Yeah. It's by the fire station. Yeah. 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 There's another, another shot of the Adams brothers. And they went all the way until 1961. The next, is the next shop a demol demolition penny? No, I don't. I don't, we don't okay, know. this was all to the Pittsfield dump and then burn. That's why it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah. 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 yeah? This is Joy Street. Yeah. Okay. Pittsfield Shoe Company. And over here is where the tannery is. Mm. So two shoe factories. Right behind the tannery. That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the smokestack provided uh, heat for the buildings. Yeah, so the first they, one there was only two stories high to start with. This is the one that they added the story to. Right. In 1880. Well, no, that's the other building. This, and, this one here. Yeah. And okay. then... In 1888, they added a third floor to the first one, and what funny, happened while the, they were the, building The funny them? story about that is that they took the roof off so they could add another story, got a torrential downpour, yeah. and they ended up having to drill holes in the floor because the water was building up and getting too heavy. Wow. So, I can imagine they were a little bit less than happy about that. But and that's, the Almighty the, says, uh, rain, it rains. That smokestack... Um, the first one blew down and they had to rebuild it. It was a big storm or something. And these became known as Riverside Number One and Riverside Number Two. Mm -hmm. Now on George Street today, there's a uh, foundation. Yeah. Was that a walkway between the two buildings? I have not seen the foundation. I'll show you. One of these days you come. I'll show you. You can't miss it. It's by the George Street Park. You see, I've, I've been all the way to the back of the tannery, okay. and that's that's as far as I've gotten. I I used to do business with the tannery, and then when Marston's were renting the back, I used to go down there to visit with the mechanics. But the second one burned in 1908. I guess it was a pretty bad fire. The next. When, when you say the second one, are you saying the large one in the foreground? No, the this, one in the back. This one over oh, here. The back, it burned. Yeah, oh, everything yellow. So that's where Rusted Cross and Domenico are. Yeah, they're up th that end, yeah. That one burned. And there, then, there it is coming down. That's, this is the number one. The first one, the bigger, the three story one, the first one. Also, was Torn down in '62. You can see modern parts there. One bed at a time. That's the Pittsfield weaving. That uh, I don't. Again, I don't know if that was owned by the Zins or not. Yeah, there wasn't very much information about this that Larry gave us, but this is what he said it was on his paperwork. George Fries, which is Fries' pretty big name in Pittsfield. That was the name of one of the Fries brothers, wasn't it? The big band? Yeah. 
So they sold the property to the Wilkerson Shoe Company. The company remodeled the building and installed machinery since in 24, but it was unsuccessful. In 26, they sold it and gave everything back to Mr. Freeze, which then I maybe became a leaving company. I don't know mm. about this. But okay, but what were they? The, the, where they made the, the labels, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's where I thought the Zins had, whether it's the same label company, the Zins started the, you know, they, they became the label company. So this is a modern picture of where the, like, the last uh, fact it was. You know, this is, we don't have an old picture of it on Barnston Road there. And 53, the Pittsfield Shoe Company was over on Joy Street and they, they didn't want to keep renewing the lease there. They wanted a new building because they were making women's shoes and the equipment that was over in the old building wasn't like right for what they were making. So 53, they, they stopped leasing at Riverside Number 1 on Joy Street and began this building and then built another um, addition in 62 and they were making up to 6,000, I, I assume they're pairs of shoes per day. But the railroad stopped in about 52, was it? Yeah, yeah early, yeah. yeah. So this is all modern, basically. Yeah, you can tell by the vehicles. They made women's novelty shoes. I think those are, am I right? Those are some of the shoes that are on display here? The women's novelty shoes? They were the like cellar? pointed toes, high yeah. heels. Yeah. Your yeah. okay. yeah. toes, high heels, they're bright red. Yep. Well, those. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> my mother, yeah. my mother did work in there in the office in the '60s, but short for a little while, and then I guess the last company was this preview, and then there were no more shoes uh, in there after that, and now it's what. Atlantic Safety now. Atlantic, so, Atlantic Safety now. Atlantic Safety. Yeah. I don't know. In the church. In the church. Yeah. Right. The senior side. The senior side. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Penny and I belong to a shoemaker's guild, and we travel around, and I don't know, you remember the Wizard of Oz? The wizard was going to go back to Kansas and hobnob with other wizards, right? So we're going to go and hobnob with other shoemakers. These are different shoes. Of course, everyone brings shoes that they've made. This is a high-end bootmaker in Guthrie, Oklahoma. And this is a pair of shoes made by a friend of ours. Um, these are in the Cowboy Museum, Yeah, Penny? in Oklahoma City. That's in Oklahoma where I, City. Yeah, that's where I took that picture. So, um, this, this woman here, her name is Lisa Sorrell. And if you want a pair of boots made by her, you're going to sit down first before you talk about the price. <laughs> a, a basic entry-level pair of Sorrel boots starts at $3,000. So you got to really want, and also, I mean, you can see the incredible, that's all leather. That's not stitched on. The, that's inlays done by Lisa. She's an incredible artist, and she's an incredible craftsman. Uh, it's, one of the shoemakers guilds that we were at, there was a bunch of Western bootmakers there, and they were all standing around and talking. Of course, I mean, they're, they're high-end stuff. They're doing high-end stuff. And they're talking amongst themselves about who's the best. Now, every one of them wanted every one of the others to say that they were the best. I'm, you know, I want you to say I'm the best, right? But I don't want to say that out loud. So they're all discussing this, and they just... And then they're naming this, oh yeah, he does some really nice work. Name that one, yeah, oh, phenomenal craftsmanship. And they, somebody said, Lisa Sorrell, and they all stopped. Mm -hmm. And they all nodded and said, yeah, she's the best of us. So she may well be the best bootmaker in the world. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's really cool because she's a friend of ours. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> These are turned shoes from the early 1800s. Notice again, go back please. Notice again, it's a straight lasted shoe. It's not left or I, I keep moving my hand to the left or the right when I want the pointer to go to the left. 
It doesn't work well that way. Anyways, it's a straight lasted shoe and it goes on either, either foot initially. Now after you've had the shoe on, it becomes a left or a right. So, you know, I, I'm wearing a pair of my straight lasted shoes and you wear them for a half a day and they stop being straight lasted and they are now designated. So, so I'm going to go kind of yeah. quickly through these. All right. <coughs> I do apologize for the cheesiness of the drawings. This is something that we could find online and this is all we could find for a turned shoe. So, so yeah. Why do they call it a turned shoe? We're going to get to that. Yeah. Um, you sew them inside ahead. out. Go ahead with the next there. Yeah. All right. This, you sew on the binding across the top of the shoe where your, where your ankle comes out and next and there's a bucket of water a hammer and a, a lap stone you beat the finished sole on a lap stone and what that does is it takes you wet it and you beat it until it's dry what that does is it makes all the fibers of the leather, the leather mash into each other and makes it even even tougher and it compresses it, it makes a stone out of a piece of leather. I mean, I'm exaggerating a good deal, but you get the idea. So, there's the last. This is a, it doesn't belong in the picture, but it's a burnishing stick, which I have here, and that's designed for, where's my finished shoe? Once the shoe is finished, you take, you see the shape of that? right there. You burnish the edge of the sole with that. Moisten it and just go over it like that until it's smooth and shiny. So that's the burnishing stick. Um, you see the groove that's cut in the channel. I've got a, I've got a piece that I can pass around when the lights come back on. Go ahead. And a curved awl. And you poke the holes in the channel so that it comes out the side. Comes out the edge of the shoe right there. No, okay, this is a turn shoe. I'm sorry. No, that doesn't. That comes, it, it comes out over here. It grabs the upper. Lasting pincers. I'll demonstrate those. And again, this is the hand stitch, all right? It's just you two needles, or historically pig bristles. You poke the hole, you put one bristle through, you put the other bristle through, you pull. Before you pull it tight while there's still a loop on one end, you pass the pig bristle through the loop and tug it tight, and you end up with an overhand knot inside the hole so that if, you, if this is the out, out part of the sole, you walk on that and you wear the thread out, you've still got a lock stitch on the inside. And I just, I, that's borderline genius because mm -hmm. who'd have thunk it, right? These are just burnishing soles, burnishing um, sticks for the soles of the shoe. Once you get the, you make the shoe inside out. Just like you would make it, so a dress, it's inside out, and then you turn it right side out. That's why it's called a you have to, shoe. You have to saturate, keep the shoe saturated, and turn it right side out, and relast it. And one of the other PowerPoints that I gave a bunch of years ago at the Shoemakers Guild had pictures of different shoe constructions. We couldn't find it. So, that's the best explanation I can give for that. <laughs> Thank you for your forbearance. <laughs> Anyways, um, this is the burnishing stick. Um, just polishing the bottom of the, of the sole. This, uh, that I have never seen. The, um, so now it's right side out and that's just a sock liner yeah. in there. And, uh, most shoes, most turn shoes, were ladies or children's because a man's shoe 
needs to be sturdier. The insinuation is he's going to work harder. It needs to be sturdier, so you can't turn it out. The, the leather that you use is too stiff and too thick to turn it inside or to turn it right side out after you make it turn. This is uh, some of the these are lasting pinchers. This this face of the hammer is very smooth and somewhat rounded. That's just a, a standard tack hammer with a magnetic end right there. Um, a straight awl. Um, I think that's a clicking knife and then just another knife. These two are the quarters and this is the vamp and this is before they're dyed on a black for contrast and then I put it on a white background after it was dyed. This is the closed upper. Um, this is a machine song, I think. Yeah, no. it's a mach machine song. Um, and there's a counter. Uh, you can almost kind of see it right there. But actually, I'm here. We're almost through with this person. I'm just going to do this faster and then okay. people can pass it around. Don't kick the bucket first. <laughs> <laughs> Last inches. That's this process is what I'm going to try to demonstrate. And I have that very piece. I never finished that shoe because it made such a darn good demonstration piece. <laughs> so there it sits. And that one on the right is the same one. This is the finished shoes, ready for the buckles. And who is that handsome son of a gun? <laughs> this is what we usually do in the summer times. We travel to these. Yeah. And. Um, Put our shoes that we bring all our shoes with like 50 60 pairs with us so we have every size that one was at four nine satisfied one. customer <laughs> and she's carrying those her are her own. old shoes because yeah, why would i wear those when i can wear those she portrayed a soldier that ran with the cannon she yeah you know pulled the cannon did you make the old shoes no <laughs> and then you have to put the buckle in installing on. the buckle Right there. Special thanks to Larry and Liz and the Pittsfield Historical Society. Thank you. Can we get the lights again, please? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When did we get to the shoe repair? When did shoe repair start going through existence? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Well, I was growing as a kid, you know, great. Shoes and the leather sold wore out. Yeah. When did when did that industry industry start? When people start bringing their shoes in to be repaired? Everybody? As soon as shoes started being worn, the guy that made them, you, my shoes wear out. I'm going to bring them back to the guy that made them, and he'd repair them. Okay. So you know, um, unless you were extremely wealthy yeah, yeah. and didn't need to wear the same dress twice. <laughs> so. But yeah, shoe repair has been a lot around for as long as shoes have been made. Um, the difference between a cobbler and a shoemaker is not always obvious. People say, oh, you're a cobbler. And I say, yeah, I do some repair, but I, my primary focus is shoemaking, right? Historically, we're colonists. We're British. The guild system is extremely powerful. Whatever the trade is, they had a guild, and it was extremely powerful. Laws were passed making it illegal for you to make a shoe until, or call yourself a shoemaker, until you had finished your apprenticeship and had your quality approved by the guild. So, if you're my apprentice, and I get in my cups and beat you three times a day, you might want to take to your heels and run away. If you do that, the first thing that happens is you're a criminal. You have broken your contract with me. The second thing that happened is you've got a bounty on your head. If you're old enough to run and make it on your own, I've already invested a lot of money in you. Okay, your job at this point, until your apprenticeship is done, is to make me money. I'm going to take an ad in the newspaper describing everything that he wears, because let's face it, 
It's my cast-offs. I know what he wears. I know what he, you know, I'm going to take an ad out and somebody is going to go looking for you. And so in order to avoid getting caught, again, you've got a bounty on your head. You might go to one of the outer reaches of the colonies, maybe a fort that's somewhat established and less apt to be attacked by the Indians. So you might go over there. There's a fair chance that if the newspaper that if that newspaper gets there, you might not be able to read it because you don't know how to read. So he's going to go over there, and there's still a bounty on his head. So he's not going to put up a sign that says shoemaker. He's not going to draw attention to himself. He's going to fly under the radar, and he's going to very quietly buy worn-out shoes, patch them in whatever way he thinks he can and just as quietly resell them. So if you've heard the words cobbled together, I have no documentation to correlate the two. But having seen some of the repaired shoes, again, Charlie and Charlie yet in shop, uh, having seen some of the repaired shoes, uh, okay, if that's cobbler work, then I can see how the words cobbled together could mean shoddy. So anyways, um, that's the, uh, take that, throw that around. Have you ever seen a shoehorn and wondered where the name came from? It's a horn. That's a horn. That's a horn. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real horn. I'm not putting All right, here's a partially closed upper. I'm going to move this over here, so to, uh, if that helps you. Look at the underside of that seam. How the heck did I do that? I'm going to show you the stitch right here. If I can remember where I put them. I took them out. Where did I put them? so I have to stand here. Here's a piece of leather. Here's another piece of leather. That stitch that's getting passed around right now with no thread on the bottom side, again, with a curved awl, I have the, awl, the awls up here. Later on you can come and see them. You take a curved awl and poke in here come out there. And it's the same thing, two needles or two pig bristles and two threads. You put one through, you put the other through, you pull it, and when you pull it, you're jamming these two pieces closer, to let, co closer together and it leaves a little bit of a mound right there. And you'll be able to see that when you see the shoe. Um, making this stitch it's called a round closing. It's also called a butt stitch, but those of us in the know call it a round closing. Um, I think, is there anything else I need to, oh, also look at the back part. Take that, pass that around, look at the back part. It's got a heel counter in it to stiffen the heel um, and that's a, as modern as it is historic. Some, some historic shoes were made without that and they just walk right off the sole. They, the outside and, edge of the just walk and you just round right off. And the heels are pegged with, with the pegs there. Right, look at the, look at the, 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 look at the bottom of the, the heel and those are all wooden pegs. Now this is really cool. You take three layers of three three thicknesses of leather, you put them together, you take an awl, a straight, fairly heavy 
all, you pound a hole through all three of them. You take a peg that's a little bit bigger than the hole, and you pound it into the hole. You do that all the way around, and you'll see that when you get the shoe. Um, but the cool thing about this, what happens to wood when it gets wet? When it's dry, it gets wet. It swells up. So when you're walking through the wet grass, when you're walking through a puddle, when you're walking down the muddy street, the wood swells up and holds the leather in place. This is cool. When leather is wet and dries out, so when it dries out, the leather shrinks to hold the wood. I hope the guy that figured that out died rich, because that's <laughs> genius. What's, what's that? I've got wooden pegs. You have wooden pegs? I, I bought an old, old place, and I've got an old workshop on my property. And in the course of poking through the workshop, I found a whole bunch of um, various cobbler tools and a box of wooden pegs in there. And I got some old boots, and I was seeing some of these pegs in the heels. And I said, do they really do wooden pegs? <laughs> So, yeah. that's, that's the kind of reason I came here tonight. Is it a 10 footer? <laughs> and see if they really use them. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. You now know why. Yeah. Uh, was it a 10 footer? A, a little 10 oh, foot? No, 12 it, foot? No, I, no, it's a lot bigger than that. Okay. Yeah, it was used for a blacksmith shop. All right. And various other things. But I'm beginning to wonder now whether um, the owners, the people that live there, made shoes in the wintertime. It, it, okay, I could, pardon me, Epsom. Census records, every third person on the census records was involved in shoemaking in some way. Shoe factory, you know, shoemaker, boot maker, you know, harness and shoemaker. Right? Almost every third person. And they made shoes in the wintertime because they were farming during the summer, you know, unless they were in the factory later on. But, um, so yeah, almost almost everyone, and I'm, I'm sure Pittsfield was just as full of 10-footers that became garden sheds or, uh, you know, little woodworking sheds, something like that. Um, yeah, I guess so. This was a, pe a free piece of leather from the Suncook Tannery. <laughs> um, Several years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it was marked up exactly like it was when they gave it to me. Yeah. David, David's been good to me over the years. But this side doesn't, you can't see the lines. Now this down here, this is pine tar. When I make thread, I have a, an industrial ball of hemp, single strand hemp. And what I do, and I, I told you about the hemp and the flax, and I'll take, um, it's, this is already spun. It's several strands of hemp spun together into a, a single cord. And I'll it's really fine, easily broken. Um, you put three or four of these pieces together, and you drag it through a hardened pine tar uh, ball players use pine tar on their bat handles. It's the same product. Um, so you drag it through the pine tar and then you put it here and you roll it. Ed, I didn't see you come in. Hi. <laughs> Pardon me. So you, you roll the thread like that and then you kind of seal it and it stays rolled. And when you do that with, I mean, three pieces of unwaxed thread, still just as easy. You wax them together, you break them, but it's a lot stronger. Um, so, where did I leave off? So you were gonna show how to last. I'm, I'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to last. So, it might be a little water there. I just think of that. Um, notice the bottom of the last peg has, has um, nail holes in it. 
Also, this is my demo last. So I actually traced, you see the black line. I'm going to cut a piece of leather the same shape as the black line, and I'm going to put a tack there, there, and there to hold it in place temporarily. Pretend this already has it on it. I couldn't find one today, and I just said, ah. The upper has been soaking in water for as long as I've been speaking. It should be pretty darn malleable. So I'm going to take it, put it over the last like this, This is the carousel that holds nails. I've seen them advertised as uh, cornbread molds. <laughs> you know, okay, um, don't take this the wrong way or anything, but you're leaving your ignorance out for us all to see. <laughs> I'm going to sit down for a minute, and I'm going to take... I'm going to line up. I don't know if you can see it. There's a small... No, this doesn't. Normally... There's a small notch right in the center there. And the seam in the back, you line the back up. Leave it. Can you all see how much I'm leaving? Okay. Later on, I'm going to do what's called hoisting the heel. I'm going to grab my temporary tacks. These are cut nails. And some of them are advertised as sanitary and I <laughs> sanitary nail well historically shoemakers and collars take a fistful of nails and put them in their mouth and leave the end sticking out and manipulate them with their tongue in order to separate one out <clears throat> and they could just go like that and put it in so the nails had to be cleaned I don't. I don't like a bloody tongue. <laughs> so I'm just putting a, a nail through, actually through the lower end of the back seam. Just put it through the seam because later on I can give it a couple taps with the hammer and the hole disappear. So I've got the back. I need that. In more and I need another one in there higher up. I want to keep the seam, the back seam, lined up with straight with the back of the last. The lasting pincers. Remember the the broken pair that I got from Bob Feeney? <laughs> they still work. <laughs> so I'm going to grab right where the right where the notch would have been, and I'm going to stretch it over the last. I'm going to lay it down. This is where Risking the bloody tongue would have come in handy. Need another hand. Yeah, it's one of these deals where I could use an extra hand, but yours are no good to me. <laughs> so I do one in the center, and then I do one on either side. I basically make a pie out of it. Hold it there. Grab another one from under my tongue. I just think that's a genius tool. It, it's, it's fulcrum, it's pliers, and it's hammer. Just plain cool. All right, maybe I'll try two at a time. Do it dangerously. 
else would we look for talking? <laughs> Carousel is a lot higher, so I'm just going like this and putting nails in. side, then on this side, then on this side, then on this side, because I need it to pull evenly. When I get done, when I get this around, I'll, I, I have a, I have to put a shover in and I'll, I'll show you what that is in a minute. Once I get this stretched to the point where I know it's going to hold, You know, you know the trick about when the hammerhead gets loose and you stick it in a bucket of water to make it tight again? Okay. It just happens. They, well, yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> because what happens is the wood swells and it's never, ever going to be tight again. As soon as it, you're going to have to wet it every time you use it. A buddy of mine told me about yeah, you just stick it in a bucket of water and that fixes the... No, it doesn't fix the head. It uh, makes it so that it, it's never tight again. He was a plumber. He didn't work with wood. So, Bruce, are you going to just tell like what, what will be happening next? I'm going to get this to the point of the shover and then we're going to move on to the next. And I, I have pieces that I can, again, pass around. How long does it typically take to do the complete shoe? It depends, I'm sure, on the shoe, but an average. Much depends. Um, this is uh, completely colonially correct. Every stitch like that, you know, 100%. Um, I also make a historic shoe, or, or a, a, a modern shoe with a historic upper all machine sewn that way. Um, many years ago I did an experiment and I put Monday, let's say, I cut out six pairs of shoes, the uppers, and you know I started cutting out the shoes and then on Tuesday I finished cutting out the shoes and I started cutting out the inner soles and the counters and everything and um, then started skying and sewing them together and everything. That following Saturday, no, it was Friday. I was finishing up the final touches on the six pairs of shoes. So the average is a little bit better than a pair a day. Yeah, those those were machine sewn. Right. Right. This one here, the joke that I tell people say, "How long does it take you to make the hand sewn shoes?" And the joke that I've been saying is, "About eight movies." <laughs> <laughs> Penny and I did a totaling up um, based on this is how long it takes me to do this stitch, this is how long it takes me to do this stitch. We came up with about 40 hours. 40. So yeah, 
Of the hand sewn. Of the hand yeah. sewn. So what am so, I? Go ahead. The hand sewn shoes are still really cheap at eight hundred dollars. So compared to cause, what? Because I'm putting yeah, well, the hours. That yeah. pair of shoes, I'm putting probably seventy-five to a hundred dollars worth of materials into it. Leather's not cheap. I mean, something's got to die in order for you to use something out of leather. You need to make something out of leather. So, you know, um, leather's not cheap. And we have so few tanneries left in the United States. We just would, we're so busy not polluting our air and our water, we'd rather pay those other countries to pollute their air and their water. So, anyways, so, uh, that's uh, uh, as political as I'll get tonight. <laughs> so, uh, what so, I was going to say ahead. was, even the machine sewn ones, he still does his step by hand. This is, yes. That the, the lasting machine that was invented by Yanni, Yanni Milkerson, I think, the dark skinned fellow from Africa. Um, I have never seen one. I would love to. A friend of mine in Wisconsin has the next generation of that. It's a flatbed lasting machine. You do this to the last, you put it, mount it on the machine, and then it's got levers and foot pedals and there's a lever over here that you need to swing your hip into at the same time that you're pushing down with your foot. There's a lever over here that does this, and I'm making some of this up, but there is a, a lever that you have to hit with your hip while you're doing another process. Uh, he told me where I could find one of those, and he did not tell me what it was going to cost, and nor did he tell me how much he had to do to his in order to get it functional. I don't know if you folks know where my shop is in Epsom. It's between the traffic lights on right, right on Route 4. Not a really big shop when you consider all the things that I have in it and all the things that I'm doing there. So I last all of my shoes by hand. Um, so anyways, this, where is my, here's my shower. I don't know if you remember the shape of the last. It was really flat over the instep. This is, okay, see that? It's also, you've seen lasts that they call them broken. You put them here, you push down, and they're spring-loaded. They break, they bend. They call that breaking. You can bend it and take the last out of the shoe. This does not have that. In order to make it so that we can take it out of the shoe, we cut down on what's called the cone, the, the front part right, right before where the, where the candle goes. <laughs> so, and then what you do is you take, this is called a shover. And it's so called because you shove it over the cone. And you have to gauge where it's going to be by your finger. And the bigger the shoe, use the same shover. You just put, push it further in or pull it further out. And so you, you, you put it in, and then, let's see if that will stay there. We try to last the sides. So that basically makes it so that when you're done doing this, you can actually get the last out. Right. Otherwise, it'd be too tight in there. The shover. Once the shoe is made, the shover gets pulled out. That's why you saw the, can't find it, oh, it's there. That tab, I put my pliers on that and I give it a reef. The shover comes out and that gives me enough space to pull the last. So. Anybody else any questions? How long have you been doing this? I've been saying about 30 years for about five years. <laughs> so, <laughs> what got you interested in doing something like this? 
Uh, my grandfather, a little bit of a backstory. Grandfather was a letterpress printer, worked at the Rumford Press in Concord. Um, back in his, he was born in 1888. So back when he was apprenticing or itinerating or whatever, the print shops were full of consumption. Grandpa came down with consumption. Went to the sanatorium in I, not Oklahoma, I don't know, one of the upper Midwestern states where the climate was better for him. And one of the things they taught him as therapy was leather craft. So when we kids were little, we had moccasins that Grandpa made. How cool is that? <laughs> When Grandpa died, he had some wallets that he had made. My older brother and I inherited a wallet that Grandpa had made. That was my initial interest. And I was, it, but it always stayed with me. Leather, for some reason, always, ever since that, stayed with me. Um, when I was about 14, I started, I discovered Tandy Leather. And Dad had to drive from Concord to places south of Manchester and he'd stop in and feed my addiction so <clears throat> but I can't market to save my life so I'd make stuff and I'd sell it for way 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 too little money you know and I couldn't make any money at that so I love leather what am I going to do well, I took a, a temporary job to learn how to repair shoes in Guilford. I don't know if any of you remember John's shoes in Guilford, um, right near the Kmart. Anyways, um, I worked there just paying for my education. I, I didn't get any money for it. And uh, I, put out, I learned to put out some decent work. And I made my mother a pair of shoes, Mary Jane shoes. They were square dancing at the time she and dad. And I made my mother a pair of Mary Janes, and she loved them. They fit her perfectly. They felt really good on her feet, and <laughs> okay. So making shoes, and then I got this idea, this 35 or so years ago, that we. A friend of mine took me to a reenactment, French and Indian War reenactment at the fort at number four. And I just had this idea. I wonder if I could make like historic. I wonder if there's any, if there is anyone making shoes for these guys. And uh, so I had the idea all those years ago. And I just kept it in the back of my head and I started making shoes. We developed a line of modern shoes. Uh, what, 25 or so years ago, Penny? Something like that. And I developed the product. It's when David Ossoff was still doing the tannery. And I'd go in there and I'd get hides from them and I'd make shoes out of them. And I, get, I was getting the same hides, so, you know, con continuity in my product. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I must have made 15, 20 pairs of shoes. I just gave them away. You know, what size are you? Here, <laughs> that, try that. How does that feel? You know. We were on, our, on an airplane on our way to the Shoemakers Convention one time and uh, sitting down talking to this fellow and uh, what do you do? You know, you're talking to people and he's, he says, what do you do? I said, I'm a shoemaker. And then I said, actually, you know what? What size foot do you have? He told me and I pawed around in my carry-on bag and I pulled out a pair of shoes and put them on. I said, how does that feel? He said, it feels really good. I said, take them. What? Yeah, here's my card. <laughs> You're the guinea pig, okay? These are all prototypes. They're not for sale. So if they bother your feet, if they come apart, and any, I need to know. So anyways, I did that, and then promptly sold two pairs of shoes in the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we found this market, the guy in Wisconsin that has the, the, the funky machine, okay? His machinery and his body failed him at the same time. He was making these shoes for Colonial Williamsburg, for Jamestown, for all of the historic museums, and a lot of the historic um, catalogs. And he just, he had the clicker, he had the clicker dies, he clicked me out, a cardboard run of his 
uppers. So he gave me my star. So we've been following this circuit almost ever since. So. Yeah, I think, does it matter? I saw Ed's hands up for a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, how long do lasts last? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking if you keep on driving tax in, I'm thinking of like drafting boards where you would use thumbtacks to hold the paper. And after a yep. while, you get so many holes that the wood begins to fall apart. And so I'm thinking you would have to probably replace your lasts, right? You drill holes where the worst wear is. You take a dowel that same size, you glue it in, and your last is as good as new. And, and most of our lasts that we use now are plastic, and they're harder right. than the wood, so they don't wear out. It's a hard, hard plastic. So um, There was a shoe factory in um, Fitchburg, Mass, that uh, closed. But before they, <coughs> excuse me, before they closed, they bought out every other shoe company as they closed. You've, if any of you have been in a, a, a former factory, it's just one huge football-sized warehouse floor. And they had Gaylord boxes, four foot by four foot by four foot tall, full. They had 120 different styles of shoe lasts. Some of you remember the earth shoes in the 70s with the toe higher than the heel? They bought out that factory when they closed and there were earth shoe lasts there. Well, a friend of mine had told me what to look for in the last. He was the shoemaker at Colonial Williamsburg, master shoemaker, incredibly gifted and knowledgeable. He told me, don't buy a last that looks like a shoe. Buy a last that looks like a foot. Wouldn't have thought of that, but it made good sense. So I went around that Fitchburg factory and I went Gaylord diving. I'm inside these dumpsters, pawing around, pulling out shoes. And I, the one comp, the one last that I found that had the most sizes. I got size A, size B, size D, and size E. I missed, I think I missed the size C or something. Anyways. And I went and I found the most complete run. And when I first went there, I was paying three dollars a pair for the lasts. And then I was paying, ooh, a lot of people coming to buy these. Then I was paying five dollars a pair for the last. Then I was paying seven dollars a pair for the last. Then I was paying ten dollars a pair for the last. Still ridiculously cheap. For a while, I was the go-to guy. I sent lasts to Sweden. So just, what, what can you, here's what I have, can you send me as many as you can? Fine, so, you know. Anyways, that's how I found the lasts that I used for the, for the lefts and rights, they're modern lasts. And um, that was just, I don't know what any of you have for faith, but I put a lot of it in the Creator. Um, in the Bible, when uh, Moses was commanded to build the, the tabernacle. God told him, take Bezalel and Oholiab. These are men whom I have filled with the Holy Spirit in the use of their hands. And I remember the first time, <laughs> watch. I had the same reaction the first time I read that. It was just so cool. But uh, anyways, um, where did I leave off? <laughs> okay, this, the hoisting of the heel, once this gets here, I'm going to pull these tacks. There's nothing to swell on that. Please stop. Please stop. I wonder what would happen if I put this bucket out of the way. <laughs> Don't you hate it when you leave your stupid out for everyone to view? 
All right, I'm getting ready to pull these tacks out because I want to show you how to hoist the heel. I have a, a tack puller, but it's in the box and I don't want to go pollen for it right now. So I'm going to lift this up somewhat until I can grab it with the lasting pincers. There's a very specific amount of pull that you do. It has to be exactly the right amount of height on this. Now you see the way that's still pulled away some? When I pull these sides in, that will draw that forward and it'll end up being tight so that the shoe hugs your heel better. So anyways, that gets a tack there, there, just like I did up here. And now I have steps in the process. I have kids come up to my workbench. Right, you want to learn to make shoes? Come here, I'll show you how to make shoes. You guys like to do puzzles? Oh, yeah, we do puzzles. Okay, watch this. That's a puzzle piece. That's a puzzle piece. Watch this. See how that fits together? Wow, yeah, so it, you do that, and then you put this puzzle piece right there. You see how that goes? Oh, nice. You stitch it up the back. What's that starting to look like? It's a shoe. <laughs> so, there's those steps, the, the, the first step. And I'll pass it around in the same order, so you get the first one, then the second one, then the third one. Um, what's that? It's getting late. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Did I mention that I'd like to talk? <laughs> that's the upper, that's all closed. Um, once this is all tacked, all the way around. Again, remember the inner sole that make believe on there? That's one thickness of leather. I have to put a cut down so that there's a, a lip there and I taper the edge. I'll pass this around, leave it out. But you can also look and see how the inner sole fastens to the upper and the welt. Okay, this piece here is called the welt, and you sew the sole to the welt. So this is what holds everything together. And then, did I already pass the finished shoe around? Yes. 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 Okay, everyone seen this? What size is that? <laughs> ten, ten wide. Are you good for it? Yeah, my, my fit. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we had a guy um, at, at an event, and our, our, our lefts and rights, they have a rubber heel, they're all machine sewn, they're $300. And um, the hand sewn is $800. I assume that people want to pay less. He put my lefts and rights on, and he says, doesn't feel I can't and he sat I sat down and I stopped yeah okay right there it's too tight and I, right there it's too tight and yeah I we tried another pair of lefts and rights we tried a third pair of lefts and rights we could not get them and then he said are these the expensive ones I said no these are the entry level he said let me try the expensive ones you put them on none of the spots where it was too tight on him with the lefts and rights bothered him in the least. I made a good sale that day. So, but, again, I'm wearing a straight lasting pair of shoes. I had to do a little tiny bit of stretching in the forepart here. A little tiny bit because my heel is narrower than my forepart. So, aside from that, they feel like left and right. So, Anyways, are there any other questions? Any 
Um, Sir. In my workshop, on this pile of stuff that I found, <laughs> I've got a little stand like you have there. It's about this tall, uh -huh. with a slot on the end, yep. and then I've got pieces of uh, look like glass, but they're made out of steel. They yep. fit on top of that. One of them is adjustable at various angles, and another one is has a big piece. What were those used for? Pegging the heel, for instance. You put on that. Yep. You put the shoe over. Yep. The steel, mm -hmm. you take the ball for the, okay. it's an anvil. All right. Um, that's what they must have done there, because there's a box of those pegs right there with the whole thing. That, exactly. So that's what that process um, is. During the Civil War, there were three different methods of shoe construction. One of them was the welted, like is going around now, and that was the first choice, because that's a superior to any of the others. The second choice was pegged shoe. In other words, you do everything, you put, put it all together, and then you put one peg through the sole, through the upper, and through the inner sole. One peg. And again, it's that magic dry out, wet, it, it holds. So, um, and I was going someplace with this and I forgot what it was. <laughs> but, uh, so I guess that's all I've got to say. Oh, She wants to say something. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if anybody would like to ask you questions, you can come up individually and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Look at my bench. According to Penny, you've, got, you've covered everything. Okay. <laughs> 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 Here's, Here's your hat and coat. Here's your brush. <laughs> no, no, actually, they can, you know, because of the time element, if anybody would like to ask some individual questions, go right ahead. Uh, the museum is open if you would like to look. There are some refreshments here if you would like to partake.